let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Who do people say that I am? This was Jesus' question of those who had traveled with him for so long. Who do people say that I am? He then goes on to say, well, who do you say that I am? And it seems kind of amazing that apparently Peter gets it right. You are the Messiah. And yet within two verses, Jesus is saying, get behind me. I wonder if you were asked the question, who are you? How would you answer it? Who do people say you are? Would the answer to the question who you think you are and who do people say you are, do you think it would be the same? (laughs) Is how you want to be seen the way that you're actually being seen by those around you? I want to ask the question, what influences our identity? What influences how we see ourselves? And what influences actually how we actually are? What is it that makes us and shapes our identity? One of the things that I'm aware of when it comes to understanding and naming who we think we are, one of the things that tends to be the case is that we've ten- tended to learn what I like to call rumours about ourselves. Rumours are incessant uh, understandings that may or may not be true <laughs> that we've come to decide are who we are. Rumours about who we are often begin in childhood. Something that a parent or a teacher or someone influential has said about you that you continue to carry to this day as being important to your identity. I wonder if you can think of something like that, something memorable. Rumours about who we are are very powerful, whether they are accurate or not. Uh, one of the example I give often that I hear people say is uh, that when we come to sing or in a choir or something like that, they, they say, oh, well, I can't sing. The music teachers in here will know that the answer usually is that they were told at some stage by someone they can't sing, or just mouth the words in the choir. And that has become the rumour about their identity. We often have identities that we have come to understand about ourselves as we have grown up. The other thing about our identity is often shaped uh, in comparison uh, to the world around us. Am I rich or poor? Educated, not educated. Which political party do I associate with and which political party don't I associate? Do I go to church? Don't I go to to church? Am I vaccinated and am I not vaccinated? Um, Our identity is often shaped in comparison to the world around us. I think 
that the difference between the question, who do you think you are, and who do you think what people would say about who you are, is really significant. Because what we come to realize is that often how we understand ourselves is more shaped not by reality, but by actually who we'd like to be. How we want to be projected into the world. I just suddenly realized uh, the best example of this at the moment is a Facebook page. The way that many people will curate their identity, not by actually who they are and what their life is like, but how they want to be seen and perceived in the world. That's actually a very natural human tendency. And we live in a society where what we've come to understand about ourselves, what we want to project, gets reinforced by what's called a confirmation bias. It means that we will reinforce that sense about ourselves by listening to those things that, that reinforce that idea and ignoring those things that might challenge it. And sometimes the image of ourselves is too inflated. And sometimes the image of ourselves is not inflated enough. Uh, particularly if we have a sense of low self-esteem. The reality is, if we are to best understand ourselves, to best understand what our identity is, it's usually best found in engagement with others. Others who can honestly tell you about who you are. The problem is we very rarely find the people who are willing to be honest <laughs> and accept the advice of those who just reinforce our own sense of self. We, as human beings, our identity is really mostly shaped by our engagement with people and the world outside us. We as Westerners like to think that we create our own story and our own identity. But again and again, there's no reason for education unless we are shaped by externals. There is no such thing as generational gaps unless we are shaped by people and events that are external to us. Just think about it. We understand that different generations, particularly in the last 60 years, have, and people within it, have developed particular characteristics and identities according to when they were born. <laughs> and mostly because of the experiences of their formative years in that time. Did you grow up uh, uh, during the, uh, without the internet? Let's go there. <laughs> or did you grow up with the internet? Did you grow up before 9-11? Or have you been born and your main experiences have been since 9-11? If we fail to understand that we who we are is shaped mostly by ex in interaction with external realities, whether we choose to follow it or choose not to follow it, we will be dragged by other people's agendas and purposes for our life and not God's. Jesus stands in front of his disciples uh, and he asks the question, who do people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And as 21st century Westerners, we often ask that question in terms of the idea that we're shaping our own identity. 
But in the first century, identity was clearly understood as shaped by the community around you, who you belonged to and what you did. Uh, you just think about what job you would have in the first century. It wasn't that, oh, I'm just going to explore all these, these options and work out what's really me, and then I'll go into it. It was, what does your family do? And how will you be trained up in that? So the question that Jesus asks about who do people say that I am has even more significance in the first century. And the reality is that the disciples who were with Jesus, and Peter in particular says, you are the Messiah. And we think, well done, Peter. And then he takes Jesus aside after Jesus says, well, I'm going to face trial and torture and death. And Peter says, if you're the Messiah, this cannot be the case. If your identity is to be that person that we think you are, that person who through religious and political power is to become our king, is by force to expel Rome, is to rebuild the temple, dying on the cross does not seem to be part of the plan. The disciples, Jesus had become for the disciples who they wanted Jesus to become. We might call it Jesus was going to help them in their civic religion. How will Jesus reinforce how they saw themselves and Israel and their purpose at that time? And as I've been trying to say for a little while, Jesus comes to transform their understanding, transform them to recognize that God's call on Israel was not so Israel can love Israel. God's call on God's people was to reveal God's love to all the world. And this is part of that transformation. And the confrontation here is, do we often make Jesus' identity suit our purposes or God's purposes? There's one last thing about identity that I failed to mention at the beginning, and it's this. Often we feel powerless in our identity to shape our lives and shape our future. We often, and particularly in times of rapid change and uncertainty, feel anxiety and powerlessness. And in those circumstances, we human beings tend to look for an individual, a leader, who seems to share our beliefs and identity, political persuasion maybe, who seems to have the power to make those changes that we want. And no matter what other circumstances around them, we will we will place ourselves behind that person, their identity, making it our own in some ways so that we might feel some sense of agency in the world. And again and again and again in human history, when we have done this, that person has, has failed, <laughs> mostly from the desire to make their identity, their beliefs happen through force, manipulation, and fear. Why is Jesus different? Why, when Jesus says, to be my disciple, you must take up your cross and follow me? For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life will save it. Why should we seek to place our identity in this person, Jesus?
I wanted to suggest to you that as human beings, we are particularly shaped not by some internal force, but by our experience around us and the people we engage with. And it and I think that idea is absolutely embedded in what it means to be human because we see this process in Christianity. If we are to make who we are the same as who people say we are, then we must be shaped by an identity beyond us that is consistent. And in Christianity, we say that is Jesus Christ. We are called not to shape Jesus and his identity for our own purposes, to make us feel comfortable. But we are called to follow the Jesus we have, not the one we want. The disciples wanted A military leader, they got a dead Messiah on a cross. We must follow the Jesus we have, not the one we want. Why? Because this Jesus has revealed God's identity to be that which is good news. That which the leaders of our world cannot match. Because God's identity has been found in the emptying of all power, in humility, all human power, to stand and face the depths of chaos, sin and evil in this world and meekly allow its power to be poured upon Jesus on the cross. Jesus' identity is shaped by love. Not by fear or manipulation or violence or force. And that love is revealed to be the very power that enables resurrection. That enables God's abundant life of peace, justice, hope and death, which is, sorry, (laughs) life that is not conquered by death, to be present in this world. And to become our own identity as we live in this world. So, some suggestions. One of the things about our identity are how do we challenge the ways in which we have misread who we actually are? (laughs) Either too much or too little. We do so by engaging with those who are wise, often different from ourselves, that enable us to see who we are clearly. For some people, that requires professional help. People who have skills to allow us to come to understand ourselves. It might be a home study group who the relationships are such And the knowledge is such that we can safely share and come to understand who we are. Ultimately, how did Christ not fall into the trap of being the world's kind of Messiah, a political leader who brought his purposes by force, manipulation and fear? He does so because of a relationship beyond himself. Not his disciples, they got it wrong. Not the Jewish leaders of the time, they got it wrong. He does so because of a relationship that he establishes with God, who he calls Abba Father. Through his own formation in scripture and prayer and worship, He comes to understand his identity different. That he 
probably wouldn't have chosen for himself. But the identity to act and be as God in this world and to reveal God's love that transforms us. Who does God say you are? Are you willing to open your lives to follow the Jesus we have, not the Jesus we want? Because that will be the Jesus that leads us into the abundant life that God intends for each of us and the world in which we live. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.